I'm a practicing psychologist. I work for various agencies and a nursing school. Um, I've done it a long time. Um, I wasn't looking for any gifts that were mystical, psychic, however you want to describe it. And at the young ages of at least 10 on, things came to me. And <clears throat> my father was a practicing psychologist. So I follow in his footsteps. And he used to say, um, well, don't tell anybody where you got it from. You can just say it's psychology. Well, of course, I went into psychology. And at the time, many years ago, it wasn't as acceptable to have, you know, all of this stuff. Now it's all known. Um, you see the people who talk to the loved ones who passed on and some of whom are charging like $500 for thousands of people to come in and only three people hear something like, oh, did you have someone named Joe who died in a car accident? Somebody of course will, um, but anyway, <laughs> what bothers me is that people aren't being taken care of. So at the early age, as Reverend Susan said, I heard this message of don't be afraid to give too much because my feeling all the time was to just be generous and your family members are the ones who will stop you sometimes. And I've heard that in many different spiritual uh, places and, and religions that they'll say that. And I never wanted to be stopped. And so even today, um, I'm going to actually expand what I'm going to give you because I want to. So what I decided to offer you, among other things, is um, if you will write down your name, address, and phone number, and then maybe at the end when I'm finished and we have some time, 1130, I guess, um, I will take a picture of you with your name, address, and phone number, and then I will send you a message. So I've decided to gift you all with this today. It might take me a few weeks to get it out, but you will get it. We have one person here who got a message from me from a few weeks ago. <laughs> okay. So um, if you choose to do it on Zoom, hi, everybody on Zoom. I don't see you as well as I see people here, but if you want to participate too, um, I'm not sure how we can do it. Maybe Jennifer, our Zoom person, can help me figure that out. With, um, I'll tell you what, for the Zoom people, you have my email and my phone number. So email me or text me a picture of yourself with your name, address, phone number, and email, and particularly cell phones. So if you do that from Zoom land, I can get something out to you, but I must have your picture so I know who it's going to. So um, all of you can just write it all out and then I'll take a picture of you at 11.30 when we're finished or whatever works out. So, and of course, I'm, I'm interested in all of your questions, which I'll be getting from you shortly. Um, so in the beginning, um, out of nowhere, I learned to do handwriting analysis without reading any books. And basically, the way I would say it is, it's shamanistic because I enter the person through the handwriting. And this could be a whole workshop because I could try to show you how to do it. And it would be involved with you. You basically take on the handwriting. You can even imitate and feel the handwriting and then you'll know more. And I can tell you a few tricks about it. And this used to be people who would know I do this, usually my family members would come to me at all kinds of times. Like, can you tell me what this person thinks of me? Um, you know, maybe someone's dating someone. Can you tell me what this person thinks of me? Because as soon as somebody writes your name, then I know something. And you might know something if you learn this. So you're not going to see it in any of the books. It's not handwriting analysis. Look it up over the web. They, may, they have some ideas that are good. But this is beyond that because this is, you want to get into a person's mind. This is how you do it with this handwriting. So it's not really handwriting analysis, it's very shamanistic, which means like when you do shaman things, you enter animals, you can shape shift, you can, you know, you find lost objects, but it's a way of basically being one with the handwriting. And sometimes you can know, I can teach you how to actually imitate the writing and feel something from it. 
And I have other tricks. So too long to go into now, but it might be a good workshop. So this came to me at an early age. And my father, who was a psychologist, um, you know, didn't understand everything about it. He was an atheist. And he would invite all his psychologist friends to come over every weekend, and I would analyze their handwritings. And I would come up with things like, oh, your, your wife doesn't like your hair. You're losing hair. And it would be an odd thing for me at the age of 10 or 12 to know that from the handwriting. And then the person would go home, and then he would, he would call up and say, yeah, my wife doesn't like my hair. So she left them later, but that's another story. But anyway, <laughs> that was before one of nine. I would also sometimes see body, you know, illnesses, um, what, what people think of you, money, I don't know, all kinds of stuff showed up. So to, if you want to get deeper into this, we can do it late, another time. And I, I know I can teach you something about it that you can use. So it came to me out of nowhere. I'm happy to share it. And I... Over time, I will, I see more than I ever say, you know, they always say, well, oh, you're a psychologist, you know, you, you're probably analyzing me. It's like, I'm not trying to, but everything's popping up at, at me because I just have other abilities. So that's one of the things. Um, other things that came to me over the years was a healing modality, which I learned in another lifetime. And while you're meditating, if you leave enough room around yourself, I'll walk up to you and I'll do some of it. I'm not going to touch your body, but I'm going to work with the energy around your body, which I see. And if there's some kind of illness or part of your body that needs attention, I will work on it. Now, I don't have a lot of time today, but during my maybe five minute meditation, we'll see if I can do any of it. Otherwise, this can happen at another time. So um, it's a, a little preview of things that can happen for you. Um, <laughs> the other thing is past lives. And often I can teach you how to find it yourself, but I can also sometimes it'll jump out at me where there, you know, where sometimes I'll just say to somebody, you know, I see this place. I see you as male, female in this country. Um, I think that happened to you a little bit. We, we caught you, we found out where you were, but you know, Sometimes it just jumps out at me. So the other thing um, that I can do is can give you a quick impression of something about you and you know walk up to you, give you a quick impression. Um, so those are <coughs> some of the modalities. When I do meditation, I've run a meditation group for your, since 93, but then I with the pandemic, my place was not as available and I had to go virtual. Um, but that will probably start up again. And I used to also teach how to go out of body. So how to, you know, if you want to get the highest level of uh, meditation, and part of it is because in my travels of being a psychologist, I ran an experiment at Rutgers where I experimented with brain waves, um, EEG, EMG, and meditation and biofeedback. And because I could go into deep states, you know, through biofeedback, I was seeing that I was in a um, theta, theta wave state, which would be like a sleep state, or delta is the deeper sleep. Um, alpha is the relaxation, beta is the everyday consciousness. So through my experience with, e, you know, oh, biofeedback, I was basically in the dream state while awake. Once you figure out how to do that, and you can, manip can manipulate your dreams a little bit, imagine, you know, being awake while you're in a dream. It's something like that, and that's something that I teach in the meditation, where when I do a meditation, I don't know how much time we'll get to do with a meditation today, I might give you a suggestion that would help you get to that deeper state. There's many, even hypnotic suggestions. Um, I learned hypnosis when I was a child from my father. Um, and, you know, in later life, I've learned to use it, you know, of course, to help people with whatever they want to do and self-hypnosis, which is very important. And the goal of any of my meditation that I do is always for you to get what you want, for you to get what you want in life, for you to be, you know, happy, healthy, successful. 
and for you to feel in control and for you to manifest these things. <clears throat> And, you know, there's many good manifestors out there. There's Abraham Hicks, and there's lots of good stuff out there. So, you know, combining it all in a nutshell and adding it to meditation and giving hypnotic suggestions, um, it's sort of like the, the basic idea is be there before you think you're there. So if you feel the emotion of already being in what you you consider your ideal state you know i call it the positive future and i'm going to add it to the meditation so in the positive future you are let's say you're happy successful you've met your goals and you're walking around and experiencing it as if it already exists so that is true manifesting like if you can walk around you can't wait for something to make you happy. You almost have to feel the emotion of being happy. And what if you were, you know, you had the money you wanted, you had the relationship or the house or the whatever it is. What would that emotion feel like? You're walking around now with these things. What do you feel like? That's the key. And that's what I'm going to try to do in the meditation as well. The other thing I try to do in the meditation, you know, I'm going to give you a sample of it when we get to it, is um, I learned early that I could, you know, I could talk to people who passed. And I've done it for years and years and years in all kinds of cases. So in the meditation, I often say, sit at a table with whoever you want to speak to. And it could be someone who passed. It could be your version of God you know, your version of anybody um, divine that you want to speak to. It could just be your mother, father who passed, anything at all or everything. And the question is always, what is your question? And then you have to listen. And what you hear in your head, even though it seems like, wait a minute, it's in my head. That's the truth. And it's, um, <clears throat> I learned uh, early that what I would hear was actually the truth. And we don't give enough attention to what we randomly hear because we think that it's nothing. But then, you know, it, it comes up in synchronicity when you think of somebody, then they call you. You know, it's that similar thing. Or you think of something. And when I'm writing messages, my earliest experience in writing messages for in general was that you know, maybe I was 12 and I would close my eyes and just write. And that was automatic writing. And the reason I write the messages is because I don't lose anything because otherwise it's diluted. So if I, you know, I could like speak as the person who you're trying to communicate with, but I'm going to lose something and you're not going to capture it. And if I just close my eyes, write the message, or don't close my eyes and write the message. You'll get much more of it. Um, I was uh, I, I was the director of behavioral health with nursing homes for like 17 years. And there was a director of nursing who lost her 24-year-old son to a drug overdose. And this was many years ago. And it was absolutely horrible. And I went to the funeral. And at that time, I'm on the down low. I'm not announcing anything about myself. And I'm at the funeral, and her son is talking to me, and, you know, from the grave, you know, from the coffin. And he's telling me, talk to my mother. Tell my mother I want to talk to her. So I said, okay. So I go up to, uh, you know, this woman, and I said to her, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say it. So I said, you know, if you ever want to communicate with your son, maybe I could help you. So that led to maybe at least two years, I think it was, of giving her regular messages from her son, which was the only thing that would make her feel better at all, because it was horrible. And this is the kind of thing that would happen. And, you know, um, because talking to loved ones is very reassuring. I mean, the worst can be, you know, losing a child, a million cases of what's the worst. Um, but it's the only consolation. So this was something that, you know, had come to me and 
you know, I always want to like help people with that. Like people who have come to my meditation groups, they would be getting messages on tap. You know, it'd be like, oh, can you get one from my mother again? And it would be like, oh, that mother's on tap. So we will get the mother who will chase other people out. And we get my grandmother too. And the mother's like taking over and the grandmother's trying to get in. But um, I had one situation with a woman who was a home health aide. And she was, you know, didn't have a lot of money. She was really struggling. She was older. She was working hard. And it seemed like nothing in her life was change, would change. Um, and I would keep giving her this message every week she came to my group. And it would be the white fence, the big white mansion, the white horses, and Marion. And anyway, and how is she going to get this? But anyway, so this went on. And I kept giving her the message. And I'm thinking, here I am, same message which that's a very important thing. If you get the same message over and over, they're telling you something. So <laughs> I did not censor myself, but instead I thought I'm gonna keep giving her this message because I can't censor it. So finally, um, she has a couple who are her patients. The woman dies, but later, yeah, the woman dies and then the man marries her. Now. She married him, but she wasn't even heterosexual. But anyway, that's besides the point. But she marries, that's another reason it was very unusual this even happened. So she marries the man, and all of a sudden she's some kind of millionaire, and she moves to Texas to where her daughter Maria, not Marion, is, and has a big white mansion and the white fence mm -hmm. and the, and the uh, horses, and she's living right next to her. So this all came to fruition, and I'm glad I never censored it um, because, you know, I've had I've had the most odd things come up in messages, and I and I learned don't censor it because I don't know what it means, and people will ask me what their message means, and I'll just say, look, hold on to your message for a while because the timeline could be anything. I don't know the timeline, I don't know the meaning, but you may know the meaning. You'll find the meaning. Okay, what are we, five more minutes? Okay. So this is something that I can do. Um, let me try and think what else would be helpful for you to know. So over time, I've had, you know, all kinds of interesting spiritual experiences that I would never expect or, or you know, I would, when my kids were little, I used to go to Barnes & Noble every week. Um, and I would run into somebody who I was reading mystical books and the person said, oh, I know somebody who can leave their body and, um, you know, you should know about this. So the person said he used to carry the robe for Padre Pio and that Padre Pio was omnipotent, omniscient, could be by locate, by locate in places. And week after week, the man is meeting with me to tell me the details, major details of Padre Pio's story of whom I never knew about. So, you know, I'm thinking, I knew it wasn't romantic. I knew he wasn't trying to, you know, and I'm thinking, what is this person, what is he looking for? Usually, I mean, this was like 30 years ago or something. And I'm thinking like, does he want to come to my meditation group? Does he want to be a patient? Like, where is this connection? Well, none of that. So every week, Detailed story of Padre Pio, never quite gave me his name, and one day he disappeared. So I went on to tell my meditation group all about Padre Pio, told all, you know, everyone I knew about Padre Pio. I mean, it wasn't the only saintly person I'd heard about, but in, in any case. Um, and later on, the only thing that anyone told me who were, who were devotees of Padre Pio is, Padre Pio wanted you to know about him <laughs> so you could spread the word. Uh -huh. And that's what that was because there was no trace. I couldn't, there was no name, no trace of who this person was. He always knew when I was going to show up and he would show up just enough time to tell me this detailed story. And as I said, I never had a sense of him wanting anything from me because usually, it, you know, it's like, well, you know, what are you looking for? <laughs> Um, so this was something that I spread the story of, and 
And some of this led to something I've done for 27 years, which is the Golden Heart Award Banquet for Unsung Heroes in the Community. And if it's based on seeing, I see people and I'll, I'll see like this divine spark in them where it's like anywhere they could be. And all of a sudden I see something so godly about them that I say, you know, I have to give you this award. <laughs> And this is going on for years. It's a big event and the politicians love it. And they give me any award I ask for. I give these awards out, congressional awards, you name it. It's a labor of love. I'm not making money on it. As I often don't make, I make money being a psychologist, but I don't, you know, I tend to do a lot for free because I just like to give. And um, so this event goes on and I realized I was explaining it to my sister and I said to her, you know, I think I just see like these wonderful things in people and maybe it's just not obvious. And that's why I keep giving these awards out so quickly. Um, like I'm in a school with a kid that is one of my clients and there's a substitute teacher and the class is really difficult. <laughs> and the substitute teacher has like this feeling of love he gives out. And he said to me, I love these kids. And I looked at him and I thought, and the kids were responding. And I've seen, it's the end of the school year. Kids are really acting out, all kinds of stuff. And they start to respond to him and he shows his love. And I said to him, you know, I see something special in you. And I'm going to tell you right now, I want to give you an award for this banquet. And he was thrilled and he was crying. And he said, I really love these kids. And like, you know, he's not making much money as a substitute teacher. We know that. And it was like, you know, he felt so validated and people feel so validated because there's not enough validation of anybody or reinforcement of the positive. You know, there's so many good things about, I, I see a lot of good in people. That's what I tend to see more than anything. I see the good. And sometimes it's like jumping out at me. And um, that's what led to this banquet, which is a labor of love. Probably everything I do is a labor of love. But I... One of my expressions is time expands. So whenever I tell anybody my schedule, they always say, no, you're making me tired. <laughs> and it's like, if I told you my schedule, you would probably feel tired. Because <laughs> I, I have several jobs, et cetera. Part -time, I have all kinds of you know, work and family members who need help and grandchildren, I see. And... I'm pretty much nonstop. So, but the energy comes from, you know, spiritual things, of course. And, you know, and I want to share this. Are we time for questions? Okay, open up the floor. <laughs> <laughs>